really the film, um, looks at Frida through her own words. Uh, and it's a mixture of archival and animation. Um, something that I think is, is really interesting about it is that Carla had this vision from the very beginning that we hadn't had a, an opportunity to hear Frida's story in her own words. And it was very important to her to be able to do that super clearly. So uh, I hope we achieved it. OK, let's roll the clip. En mi vida no he pintado sino la expresión honrada de mí misma. Para decir lo que no podía de otra forma. A lot of people in this room are familiar with Dig because it's a very lauded film from 20 years ago. But Andy, tell us about what is Dig Double X and and how what what do we have in store for everyone? So so for those of you who don't know what Dig is, Dig is the story of the Brian Jonestown Massacre and the Dandy Warhols, um, two bands that start out as just best friends and turn into bitter rivals over the seven years we're filming the original film and. We came here as children 20 years ago, and um, I had a let. I wasn't a child. I was like a mother of a 11 week old baby, who's now 20 and six foot five. Um, but uh, yeah, so it was like 27 years ago we started filming this. So the tapes were not getting any younger, and people over the years, it's such a cult classic that people were like, "Will you make Dig 2? And I was like, "There's no way I'm going on tour with these bands again. Like, <laughs> I got other movies I'm making." So my brother and I looked at each other and we're like, "What?" It's now or never. So we went back into the archive and we added like 40 extra minutes and we interwove it. And Joel Guion from the Brian Jonestown Massacre, if you know Dig, you know he's the tambourine player, but he's also a brilliant writer. And he's coming out with a book February 29th, I think it is, uh, In the Jingle Jangle Jungle, which is a tell all. And we've been following his writings. So we were like, what if we collabed with him on a new narration and like did a reimagined cult classic? And we bring the film all the way up to today. Like the story goes till 2024. So it's pretty epic. Um, Dig double X. It's uh, playing here, as you know. <laughs> yes, and we actually, I mean, hot off the presses, we are going to roll the clip right now. Oh, oh my God, it's a trailer. Get ready. This song is for Andy and her brother Dave. They're making a movie about how stupid people are and how beautiful they are at the same time. 1995. This is the year I met Anton Newcomb and his band, The Brian Jonestown Massacre. Tell me right now you've never ever heard the Dandy Warhols before. I sneeze and kids come out. We're actually going to kick off the revolution. We're going to take over the world. We're going to show you how to do it, too. Anton was my friend and my enemy, the greatest inspiration and ultimately the greatest regret. Hold on. The freeze frame's on me. You're not the only one who gets to tell this story. You guys have no idea who I just became yesterday. I will fucking kill you. Matt and Peter took off. They figured they could walk back to California. Take my name off of that. Dances looked how they look. Z looks like how Zia looks, and you look how you look, and that's how you look. This is you. I'm not for sale. You can't be that fucking naive. I'm gonna sue the sh fucking shit out of you. When you sign with a major label, they always tell you things like, we're into careers, not hits. Yet if you don't produce a hit, they don't really give a f about your career, you know? We're gonna get the biggest record deal in history because we're smart. Right on, brother. Anton and Courtney, love hate relationship, I guess. I don't like being robbed, from. <laughs> Oh, gee, we got like a pack of junkies on the road, not eating much, drinking a lot. Is anybody going to get grumpy and irritable and start fighting with each other? Is that blood on you? Yeah. From where? From your people's hand. faces. No, probably not. I'll kick your head in. You burn in hell for pretending to be God and not being able to back it up. Tell him to wear white and come when I call. He's stalking us now. Will not have him anywhere mm. near me again. I'll, I'll still buy their album, so. This was everything. I hate you, Anton. And like Frankenstein rising from the lab table comes my new ID. Typos and all. Wait for it! Ah! 
I guess I've just really low the potential. It's just very sad. Despite the fact that all your friends are retarded and you're considered insane, you can do whatever the fuck you want if you don't give up. The Brian Jones Tower massacre just erupted into absolute chaos. So that's what this movie's gonna show. <laughs> if you don't fuck it up. And then, Connor, can you talk us through Love Machina? Sure. Um, Love Machina is a um, documentary directed by Pete Sillen, who's over there. Um, it is, um, and I'm the editor. Um, it's a story about two amazing women who are technologists and futurists and have a dream of creating digital consciousness so that they can live forever and love forever. So it's basically a love story told to, through technology. Um, they, um, in their journey of creating digital consciousness, about um, 15 years ago, they created a, a robot in one of their likenesses. And that's actually how we got involved in the film at the beginning. We were basically invited to um, come meet the robot. And uh, uh, she was attending university, and then it basically snowballed from there and we found out the backstory of the um, you know the couple who had created her to to, to, to tell this eternal love story and um, and so yeah it's a trippy uh, out there um, beautiful technological love story and so we are today we're here to talk about uh, documentary filmmaking and of course the three of you represent three films in the festival but you also all are fairly accomplished documentary uh, filmmakers before these projects. So uh, could you give a little bit of background, and we're gonna start with you, Connor, and come back this way, just a, a little bit of your experience in documentary prior to this film. Sure, it's better to start with me because <laughs> I'm definitely the shortest uh, <laughs> history here. Um, uh, I've been editing for 15 years. Um, documentary has been my, my life love. Um, I, um, yeah, I, uh, have had some short documentaries that have been at Sundance here before, Bayard and Me in 2017. Um, um, I've recently edited uh, uh, another documentary uh, called Hidden Master about uh, the uh, gay photographer George Platt Lyons, uh, history of his life from the 1930s. Um, and uh, yeah, I, um, I just love documentary and it's my like life passion and I've somehow fell into editing and that's what I do now. And you, Andy? I have to say, I've dreamt to make this movie that the Love Machina. <laughs> like, I was following the story from really early. I made the movie We Live in Public and uh, and sort of was looking at, like, technology's impact on our lives early. And Martine Rothblatt, I read when she first did that. Yeah. And I cannot wait to see the film. Anyway. It's enough fabulous. about Enough about not me. What? <laughs> it's the film's fabulous. Oh, I, I imagine it is. Here we are at Sundance, where fabulous <laughs> things play. Um, so my first Sundance was 20 years ago, so this is a big return for me. Um, but I've had five films here since. I mean, so Dig was, obviously, that was amazing um, situation that happened there. And uh, it just blew the roof off over here. And um, I was just newborn baby. It was crazy. And then five years later, we came back with We Live in Public. Um, and uh, and that also won the Grand Jury Prize here. And that really kind of, I think people were like, is she a one-hit wonder? And then... They were like, no. They're like, was it just an incredible story or was it her? And then there was another story that was pretty awesome. And then uh, Last Flight Home, I'll skip forward 20 years or something. Um, Last Flight Home was a 2022 Sundance, and that was the story of my father in the last 15 days of his life and our family's journey through his doing medical aid and dying. And um, it, it's by far, to me, the most meaningful film I've ever made And that, unfortunately, Omicron wiped out Sundance that year, but it played virtually, and that was the beginning of its, of a journey that has changed my life forever as an artist. Um, so this place is really special to me, yeah. A lot of levels, and yeah, and then Megan, I mean, you you were working with me through what, how many, like, Yeah, Andy years? and I worked together for like five years? Twi well, I started with you right after Dig. Yeah. All the way through We Live in Public. Yeah, so We Live in Public, and then, Lollapalooza. We both went and did Lollapalooza together, which is now here at the festival. 
from 2005 to 2007. So, yeah. And then Lauren? Yeah, uh, I've been working in film for over 20 years. I was at Tribeca Film Festival as the senior programmer. I was there for, for 14 years, actually, um, where I was working on both narrative and doc, but I've always had a passion for docs. And this is, um, I mean, I met Andy at Tribeca many, many years ago. Um, but yeah, this is my second film at Sundance, but uh, like you, Andy, the first one was The Territory, which uh, executive produced, and it was wiped out that, that year. So it's great to be here in person uh, with, with this one. You know, so th I, like even just think hearing the stories that you all have worked on, there are so many interesting stories to be told. I mean, literally every day you open the news and you see some like stranger than fiction, wild, weird thing going on in the world. <laughs> and uh, so my question to you is how do you choose which projects that you are either going to be a part of, that you'd like to work on, that you actually want to dive in and be like, that's the one that I'm going to start working on um, with with so many you know wonderful stories to be told. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, especially as I in my role at Time, um, there's kind of, there's not a specific rubric, right? But we want to make sure that we're making st uh, films and telling stories that make an impact. Um, and that's kind of at the, the core of everything. But also, because we're time, there are a lot of different ways that we can make that impact. Um, so th we have the ability to do things like John Lewis Good Trouble or Kanye West's Genius, which, we, which was also here at the festival. Um, I think when, we, w when I look for something that I think is going to, to really make a, a, an amazing film, I'm looking for a, a viewpoint, right? So sometimes it's a director that I know. I'm very lucky to have been in the position that I was at Tribeca for so long and meet so many amazing directors like Andy and have these conversations about gestating ideas and be able to bring them to life. And then also, like you said, it's like there's so much inspiration um, just through reading, through, uh, through research, and working in the confines of time is very unique because we're working in lockstep with uh, with journalists, so we're able to kind of mine that hundred years of archive that the magazine has as well to to be able to find things. What about you, Andy? I mean, you know, it, it's gotten to the point where I'm I'm realizing that I have to say no. I'm such a yes person, and I'm so passionate, um, but I have had to learn to say no because I end up like you, Loren. You get to to do a lot of films at the same time because you're producing. Um, but as a director, and especially as an editor, it gets to be, especially when I'm editing, I just like check out of life and, you know, lose 15 pounds and the mortgage and the whole thing. So editing is very, it's an addictive thing for me, and I have to be really careful what I edit. Directing also, like, I can do a couple of projects at the same time, but I usually look for projects that are going to be um, really some question at the core that I want an to answer for myself but I also want to think about what is good. Is that question going to be relevant? Is that a question you're asking? You know, is that a question that is relevant to a wider audience? And so, um, you know, I mean, something like dig was just something that I was looking at the collision of art and commerce. I was looking at, you know, what, whether I myself would maintain my integrity as a young artist coming into the world. Um, I, you know, had a movie about a woman in prison and I was trying to get it to a big audience and it kept getting compromised. And, and I thought, oh my gosh, am I gonna? Is this gonna be a, a career of heartbreak, or am I gonna be able to maintain my integrity? Let me look at ten bands on the verge of getting signed, and see what happens with them. And that was like the beginning of. What are they of gonna do? <laughs> What's gonna? Yeah, what the heck are they gonna do? Like they're like little dysfunctional nuclear families, and you know. And so like that's kind of, yeah. And then now I look for like also elements. I realize that a project usually can't have one strand you know what i mean like it shouldn't be like like something like last flight home on the face seems like it's going to be really dark but it's a love story it's a family story and there usually has to be humor some kind of humor no matter how dark it is for me yeah. which actually reminds me of what uh how connor was describing love machina it's like it's about this but it's also about this and um but for connor connor for you how how do you you know navigate choosing which projects you want to be a part of Sure. Well, as an editor, obviously you're not choosing the subject in the same way. Um, normally you're being chosen as the editor. Um, um, but uh, for me, um, I like to choose stories that are close to my heart. Um, a lot of the films that I've done are about queer history. 
um, a lot of archive rich films. Um, that's kind of been my niche for, for a long time. And, but what I notice now um, in the films that I've done is that um, there's always a really strong central character who's normally an outsider. Someone who's either a visionary before their time or a visionary who was never noticed in their, in their lifetime. Um, um, so from like Bayard By Rustin um, to, as I said, George Platt Lines to Martin Rothblatt and Bina Rothblatt, who are uh, the couple in, our, in Love Machina. Um, I think I'm very attracted to, to a human story, but a, a real like human character story, someone who just enraptures you. And um, so yeah, a lot, I feel like a lot of the films that I do are, are based around these like strong, momentous people. And then, I mean, I think a lot of documentaries, you know, there's like the foreground, what it's about. And then there's like the overarching, like what are, what's the real theme that we're digging into here? It's something that you were talking about too, Andy. When you, like as editors, how do you go about tackling, crafting that narrative with a new project? Like, okay, we know that this is like, this is the, this is the narrative arc, but like, where do we start really weaving in what it's really about? Sure, and you don't always know that this is the narrative arc either. Um, you kind fair, of are fair. figuring that out in tandem with everything else, um, uh, 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 oftentimes. Um, um, you know, with Love Machina, um, as I said, it started out as one story, it ended as, a, as, as, as another. Um, but when you're, with, with this in particular, we're telling a story about the future, and the future keeps changing while we're still in the edit room. Um, so the themes that we would have thought that would have been the primary themes when we started out are not the primary themes that are they are right now because the world has changed and we have different talking points and we want the film to be, you know, uh, uh, important to this moment in time. Um, um, so, so yeah, I wouldn't say there is any like. Uh, De de definite like time in an edit process that you figure out what 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 what, what it, it, they, they, uh, the core themes really are, but but I feel like they present themselves. So so dig taking dig for example, um, you know, and actually you you bring this up about visionaries. Like a lot of my films are around impossible visionaries. I call them impossible visionaries because they take on the impossible and they act impossibly. Um, because they're like trying to withstand the doubt and ridicule of everybody who's like, you can't do that. And they're like, yes, we can. And I feel like I do that to inspire the audience. But usually that means it's a person that it's hard to like all the time, you know, and that may, I like that because it gives gray area for the audience. But what I've learned in, in editing is that first you have to set up in the first five to 10 minutes. Why do I want to see this movie? Because I could watch anything else out there, right? especially these days, you know, yeah, so you got to like hook in, fasten the seatbelt, right? And then if you have a tough character, what I've found is that by minute 20, I got to get the audience to understand why and have some compassion. Like if I don't love my main character in some way, even if they're really hard to love, like, like you know, I loved Russell Brand, believe it or not. Like I did enjoy making that movie, Brand a Second Coming, but it was like I have to get people to understand that he grew up in this certain way. And, and with Anton from Dig, you know, you meet his mother by minute 20 and you realize that she like sent him off to the police station for like marijuana or something and like left him there and abandoned him basically, you know? And, and like you start to feel that, but simultaneously you also have to realize like, why am I watching this? Like how, Im how important is he to the future of music? Like he's beating everybody up around him. Like he's acting irrationally, but, but, there's something there that I need to figure out and discover. And so you kind of put some breadcrumbs along, as I do in my edits. Yeah. Openings and closings are really important, I think. Very they're the important. Hard, they're the most difficult thing to nail. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think also just to what both of you are saying about character-driven documentaries, which is something that I feel super passionately about because I think that's the way you get your audience to connect, right? And if there's, if there's complexity there, <laughs> you really have to... Um, it's good that it's a, that film is a collaborative art form because you can have a lot of people that are that are your collaborators that can actually can break that down for you and say this is not working because this you you might hate this this character at this moment and it's okay to hate them sometimes. I right? actually but, had that happen. Yeah. With Dig. I had people say, you know, I love the movie, but your main character is like I can't I cannot watch this film, you know. And I had to go back and I had to think you know what, I think I'm angry with him and I need to go back in and like figure out 
where where's my emotional tether so that the audience can find theirs you know yeah we had a we had a, a really interesting um panel yesterday about collaboration and the topic of vulnerability came up both the, the necessity for vulnerability in the cutting room in terms of like trusting showing your creative choices to other people and getting feedback but also like building vulnerability into your characters so that there is that emotional attachment as is your audiences are watching you know one of the biggest challenges with documentary editing specifically is that you don't have a script that you're working from. You have you have what you have and then you have to build it's the analogy that I love is it's like putting together a puzzle but you have no reference picture of like what that puzzle is supposed to look like. That's really good. <laughs> um, and so I'd love to dig into um, the the post process for the your different films. You know, Lauren, I know for Frida the decision was made to not use any current day talking heads for uh, the film, and I'd love to hear how that sort of impacted the creative process, the editorial process of building this narrative. Yeah, I mean, that was a decision that that was made before production even started. Carla was very clear that this was, was a story to be told primarily in Frida's voice. We knew that there would be some opportunities to hear from other people, but they would have to be, there was a, there was a rule. It had to be someone who would be at a, at a dinner party with Frida, or someone who, or Diego, right? It would have to be someone who was totally connected to her emotionally and, you know, actually knew her. So the, it, it, it immediately took that <laughs> off the table. Um, but I think it was, it was, a, it was important to, to continue to, to bring these voices to life. Frida's, Diego's, their friends, Trotsky, all of these people that are portrayed in the, in the film, and it was it was a bit hard because we knew okay we're gonna have to cast people that actually can do this and we were very very I mean incredibly lucky to find this amazing cast in Mexico that that was able to do that um, you know I I think it was also important for the film to 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 have a different approach because there's a, there it could have easily slid into a, a library film right it could have been something that you you. Not that would not premiere at Sundance. I could put it that way. Um, and for us, it was like to tell a story about an artist. It needed to be an artful film. And Carla had that from the beginning, and that's that's the way we did it. And Connor, for you, you know, th the speaking of vulnerability and sort of starting to to build narratives, you and and the director of Love Machina were in different locations. So how how did you have that sort of creative conversation while in not in the same room necessarily? Yeah, yeah. So the nature of our edit, um, we basically kind of thought we had finished the film multiple times, and then uh, uh, the uh, access and the story changed to our, our primary characters. Um, so I basically, um, you know, at, it's been over the last it's been over the last few years that I've been editing it. So yes, sometimes I've been in New York with Pete. Um, and then sometimes we've been working remotely. Um, um, uh, I think with Pete, he really prioritizes sitting down one-on-one. -on -one. So we, we, we maximize that amount of time as we could. And when we couldn't, um, um, there's an additional editor working on this project as well, Ben Mercer. Um, um, and he set us up on Premiere Productions um, this year. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, is that what you mean, like in terms of like practicality? Uh, we were basically, you know, it didn't matter if we were in the same room or, you know, the same state. We were all working on from the same kind of premier productions project, which was the first time I had done that actually on uh, for, uh, for this for this film. And how did it work for you? It worked great. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean. I love remote working, you know, um, my as an editor and someone who loves to travel and live life. Um, uh, it's been great to be able to, uh, you know, travel with my edits over the last couple of years. Um, because I think that if I'm just like stuck in a hole somewhere in New York, it's difficult for me to find inspiration. But if I'm somewhere, you know, beautiful with a f fast internet speed, like, yes, let's do it. Um, and I just make better work. Um, um, uh, yeah, so, um, so, so, yeah, so we worked actually, uh, other years we worked more uh, uh, together, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, but this year there was that opportunity for more remote working through the kind of production setup. And Andy, for you, I mean, like, I, I can't even imagine, honestly, a 
going back to a film 20 years later, you said that you added new new footage, both from the archive, but also new content that you've captured. Like, what was the process of, of rethinking the narrative and approaching how to, how to revisit the story? So my nephew said to me, what is the bar? Like, what, what is, what's the standard for what is going to come in back into this movie? The movie was maybe an hour and 45 when it premiered at Sundance 20 years ago. It's 2.25 now. So it's 40 more minutes. Um, but that's cold from 2,500 hours, you know? And, um, and so we had a lot that we were like, you know what? I answered this question. I was like, context. It's about context. Like, so many scenes are, uh, you know, legendary scenes now, like the Viper Room. But why did that happen? You know, like, we didn't know why it happened. We just saw the fight happen. So now we were able to, like, go back into the archive. And, like, now you know. And then it was spoofed word for word by the Gilmore Girls. And they flew Joel down to play himself. So now, because it's we have the benefit of that a period, we could just cut to the Viper, you know, cut to the Gilmore Girls. Um, and then cut back into reality, you know, so like we just got to do a lot of really fun stuff like that. And then scenes that hit the cutting room floor because, um, you know, you couldn't have a two hour and 20 minute film back in back then. Like now people love that stuff. I still like a 90 minute film myself. But um, but, you know, just wanting to give everybody more. We went for we went for it. But, yeah, it's all very, very carefully constructed. Econ economically like worked in so you you even probably won't even be able to be like was that in the original <laughs> you know there'll be some stuff like when uh peter's like i didn't know you know about david la chapelle's music video he's like i didn't know it'd be a depp commercial and um i'm like i said to my brother i'm like dude are people gonna people know, what, know Depp, what Depp is, is? <laughs> so we found this like depp commercial to cut to you know so there's a lot of it's just that much funnier and crazier. And you and uh, your brother David co-edited this project, th this new iteration. Is no, that I edited Dig. No, no, I mean for the four years, do and he double edited X. Dig Double X. Yes, okay. He did the hands-on editing of Dig Double X because I said to him, like, it's your turn, you know. Um, also, like, if it wasn't for these young kids who came over who were just massive fans, and they moved to LA to like dig literally through the archives all summer, I don't think we'd be here. So it's kind of like, I owe it to all of them. I directed this version, but I did not edit this version, thank God. Yeah. So all three of your films uh, rely heavily on archival footage, whether it's found archival or I archival, or, you know, captured your by own you archive. <laughs> 30 years ago. Um, and, and, you know, it's archival is a huge part of do documentary filmmaking, it always has been, but through time, audiences really had to forgive a lot. You know, like, oh, the, the quality is kind of terrible or the audio is hard to hear or the, you know. So as uh, technology is advancing, how is that sort of opening up the world of what's accessible in terms of tapping into archives? Well, one thing that was that was interesting was when we when we were really in post and everything was already assembled, right, and we're, we're in our mix and we're, we're getting everything prettied up, right? Uh, our collaborators in Mexico did such a good job with the restoration that Carla saw it and called them and said, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, we have to, we have to dirty this back up, like some of this, like some of it looks really beautiful, but it can't all look like this. Like we need it to be as authentic as possible. So that's, I mean, that, that technology is really amazing. And I think also just for our archivists, like they, they're able to do their their work so efficiently because of technology and, and our collaboration and being able to to kind of put things on frame, frame IO, so that we can all look at them. And it's like breathtaking to see materials of, you know, Frida that we hadn't seen before, photos that we hadn't seen before. Um, just really r remarkable. I'm such a huge fan. I cannot wait to see this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like fangirling both sides. <laughs> And Audie, can you talk a little bit about the, the interesting sort of approach to sound from your film? Well, uh, sound and image. I mean, I, I'm with you on the AI. Like, uh, oh my gosh, the upscaling of Dig was so clean sometimes, you guys. I was like, um, we cannot show this. Like, this is You're like, like this an is animated film. supposed to be film. a dirty rock bar. That's <laughs> supposed to be Anton. Is that an Asian face of like a person? Uh, who is that? Like, AI would actually insert sometimes other faces. Like, it was insane. We had to go frame by frame. We used Topaz and we used, yeah, we used. Were you, no, version. I was going to say, were you getting a lot of like warping as well, and like we got kind of like some warp. Weird Whenever hands it was low, and, like the t weird teeth and. We, you know what it is? 
and this will not surprise you, eyes. Yeah. Human eyes. Yeah. The machine is like, I can't do eyes. You know, I'm like, good. Yeah, that's let's, right. let's that's hang right. back, bud, because I just need to know who's human and who's not for like at least five more years till I can get a grip on this. But uh, but yeah, so we had to like da- we had to like grain it up. We had to go back sometimes, but like I thought, oh well, maybe we can. And we went through this whole process. We tried to take the 25 year old footage and upscale it, just blow it up. And next to the AI stuff, it was not. It couldn't. Yeah, so we had to go back in and like literally hand do a lot of them. Um, on the sound side, Gigantic Studios did the mix, and it is it's off the charts. I mean, it's so much better than it ever has sounded. And thank God for modern technology and for Adobe. Because also for Adobe on the edit. I mean, when the files were coming back from the, you know, it was remote. Uh, all the upscaling happened remotely. When the files were coming back, they were way too big. Like, we were originally did the project on Avid, but only Premiere could handle bringing everything back in. So my brother went from, like, an Avid editor to a Premiere editor on this project. You guys won. <laughs> you won. Um, but also gigantic. I mean, um, I d- whoever in the room isn't familiar with enhanced speech, it's a new AI technology that like literally is still in beta. Um, but they used enhanced speech to pull the dialogue out of the old archival footage and then mix it back in with the original to kind of dirty it up, as you said. Um, but when we heard, we were like, oh, my gosh, it's like not even out of beta yet. You guys are no, I mean, like Courtney, the lead singer of the Dandy Warhols, would be in like a super crazy room with all this background noise and once I could hear what they were doing I was like feed it back into that enhanced speech thing again because I think we can even make it more and it just we just kept iterating till it's it's at this point now where you can hear everything things that I didn't even know were said (laughs) they're there and Connor, um, with the topic of, of your film, I'm sure AI is something that is a, a constant conversation in your life. Yes. Um, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on how you see AI impacting film, but in, in particular documentary film? Yeah, yeah. It's wild working on this film for the last kind of four or five years and this film about AI, um, working in tandem with the growth and popularity of AI. Um, seeing the differences in our industry, like talking to all of my friends and in any industry they're in, how AI, GPT, any of these things are, like everyone is using it and it's just changing. And you know, when you're kind of in the middle of this moment, kind of like in we live in public when, you know, uh, they're making this art experiment about the internet when it was, uh, you know, they were still figuring out how this was going to, you know, uh, uh, affect the world. We're in this moment right now um, I feel like with AI and and yeah, we don't know, but um, but yes, if I was to look into my crystal ball, um, <laughs> I I I think that like you know like we, yeah, we were using topaz and stuff, and we can get we can get images and video looking like so good, but um, but yeah, you're starting to lose a little bit of uh, the genuineness and the the human touch and um, um, and and my concern is that, you know, as we are able to create more, uh, you know, just uh, voices or, uh, re- you know, particularly for anyone uh, when we're dealing with archive or subjects who have passed away and we're dealing with, like, their voices or their images and there's all questions of bringing them back or, or not or whatever. Um, for me, I think the biggest question is around trust with an audience. Like, we make documentaries and it's always amazing to me how an audience is just, like, Everything you tell them is true. Like they're just like it's a documentary. Like it's it's true, you know. Um, and 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 that's kind of, you know, that's that's uh, um, an agreement between the audience and the filmmakers that we, you know, we're, everything we're showing you, we're, we've ethically put it together. With this is our true version of the story that we see. And if with you know AI manipulation of uh, uh, you know how we use. Uh, a person's image or a person's voice that the audience lose trust. I think that's my biggest concern. But generally, I'm on the side of like, bring it on. It's going to be great. <laughs> that's a valid concern, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it, it is a valid concern. And I think one of the most important pieces of that concern is to actually own the conversation, right? If we try to pretend like it's not happening and be like, oh, like, let's keep it out of filmmaking. We lose control, you know, like Adobe is really trying to to have open conversations about this because creatives are our business. Like if we were to take away the creative process with AI, like then what? 
So having the, the conversation is so important to actually own the narrative and, and drive it forward in the ways that filmmakers actually want, that, that audiences actually want. Yeah, they're, they're tools that are inevitable, right? And everyone, everyone's using them, right? We're all using them. But I think that, that ultimately there's, there's going to be a time that AI is also used as a, as a storytelling tool as well, right? So I think just being able to embrace it step by step, but, but understanding that you still have to keep the same code of ethics as you're using it, right? The, the, it, it, will, it will evolve, I think but our code of ethics and our code of truth will not, right? We, we want to maintain that, contra that contract with the audience. Yeah, well, th that was a great thing about your film subject as well, too, about, um, uh, you know, the, the, the subjects or participants in documentary film and how the, being in the film affected their lives is that, you know, you discuss it in the film, but there, there isn't any written down Eth ethical guidelines right. like it's just kind of like you hope the person's a good person who's making those decisions you know and they're, and they're um, not always but there should <laughs> there should be yes. um um you know and, and 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 it's even more prescient now i think that you know people just like in other industries are organizing around doing it they should be in this industry as well absolutely we need to keep we need to ha have that conversation here like with all of the filmmakers that that are here all of the filmmakers that we're collaborating with it's so important there's a film here eno and every version is different because AI is recutting it in between. So yeah, it's every, already here. Every audience that goes into the theater to see Eno will see a different version of Eno. Yeah, and I was talking to Gary, who directed the film yesterday, and he was like, yeah, I just go burn a DCP in my hotel room. And I'm like, how are you presenting a different... <laughs> I'm like, every screening, you have a different DCP. Like, DCP is kind of a big deal. Like, we have to kind of go to PhotoCam and do a DCP. Like, what do you... He's like, I'm burning him over my hotel room. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Here we go. So that's yeah. kind of a different thing, but it's interesting. He's like, look, I take all the tools, color, you know, I have like certain, here's the toolbox, and I present that, and now I let the machine make a new version. Yeah, so the, the last five, 10 years have really been like an absolute evolution for documentary filmmaking. I mean, there was, you know, when, when Andy and I were working together, it was like, you got your film into Sundance or you got your film into one of the festivals and then it ran the festival circuit and it was like, maybe it'll have something happen after that, but like there's no promise. And the, the, the landscape for audiences seeing documentaries has really changed. I feel like the audience appetite for documentary content has really changed. What do you think is the next five to 10 years? How do you see the documentary industry evolving from here? I'm more hopeful than maybe, you looked really bummed out right there <laughs> on that question. Positivity about the future. Let's yeah. I mean, no, the word on the street is it's not a good outlook, right? Like the word in our industry is that it's been a golden age and everybody overspent and now everybody's pulling back. That's, that's like the, right? That's, that's like the, that's the basic narrative. That's the basic narrative. I'm not really subscribing to that. I mean, I've sold my last few films. They've all gone out. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like if it's a great movie and a great story, it's going to find its home and it's going to find its audience, you know? No, and I, I'm not, I don't know. I, I think sales are starting to happen here too. Yeah, no, that's, that's, and, that's year, so. and that's very exciting. And I think that it's, it's natural, right? I think that there was a bit of a, a course correction, right? Where maybe when, when people are saying the golden age and the appetite had changed, the, the money had changed as well, right? And maybe people were overpaying, but I think at this point, it's it, it's up to the filmmakers to to understand what kind of a market we are in right now and what is viable, right? So what's feasible? Um, is it feasible to make what is a a very niche documentary with ver with not as much distribution uh, potential and give a six million dollar budget? It's not can't do that but you can do i mean like that's the thing is uh, there were films selling for like 17 million dollars that would never ever recoup that and so mm -hmm. i think that the buyers weren't considering the return they were considering the number of eyeballs they were maybe going to get for this right. and it became this like sort of 
pecking bidding war thing that happened that inflated and i think any market goes through that you know what i mean yeah. and so like that happened for documentary but we've been here where i was there before and i'm here after and like it's gonna be fine i like, think, I think we're I th all good i think yeah. what has come out of this like you know golden age of of um you know uh documentary filmmaking episodic etc is that like i feel like it's created these audiences and you see it in the like you know podcasts and everything like i feel like all anyone talks about now is what are you watching? Like, what are you listening to? Like, people want content. They want, um, people are far more, they, they, they have higher tastes and they're more mature and they're more understanding of, uh, um, you know, more complex narratives. Um, and I think that we can keep pushing that. I think it's really exciting. Um, in the terms of the five to 10 years, like, I wonder, you know, we're talking, uh, when you're talking about the, the future of technology, we're, we all talk about AI right now, but it's also like how we consume or how we uh, would watch documentary moving forward. And I think that like the traditional um, industry of how we watch a film or even a film being like a 90 minute film kind of weathered the whole COVID storm and now people are going back to the cinema and like, you know, you know, we'll still watch 90 minute films on, on, on Netflix. But I feel like more and more people are just consuming things on YouTube or, or in like a less traditional way. And I could see, you know, the industry having to adapt to that. And maybe that will also be in terms of who's making the movies or, you know, what length they'll be or what they'll be about. And what impact do you think that more accessible technology or like the ability to make documentaries will potentially diversify the stories that documentaries are covering we've or the types that. of filmmakers yeah, that are actually we, making we've them. We've seen that. Like since I was here, I mean, I, I mean the problem with having a 20th anniversary film is that you kind of admit your age, you know? So we're, we've established that, but I'm saying like when, when I was here with, doc, with Dig originally, documentaries were not a thing that people were really watching, you know? And so I think you're right, Connor, like there's such a massive audience for documentary. They understand now that it can be more exciting than scripted. They can, that it's real, like that it's, it can be unfolding and dramatic. And now the boundaries of the form are pushing. And I think that as we see this new technology come in, it's, uh, it's even gonna push the boundaries even more and make it more and more exciting. I remember when, you, when we were working together, going to uh, you know, a, a store or something and somebody struck up a conversation with me and I said, oh, I work, I'm a documentary filmmaker. And they were like, like National Geographic? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. I mean, no, but you know, like, like you never. People know, like they love documentary now. It's a, it's a. I, I think that it's not. Maybe the golden age, things are shifting, but I still think like the appetite and the desire to watch. Running time real is shifting. World. Running time yeah. is shifting. You Definitely. know. Yeah. And I, and I think just to your point about accessibility, it's like right now, most of us have the ability to capture, edit, and even distribute our own films. In, in a matter of minutes at times, right? Like when you're talking about how people are consuming um, media on YouTube, on TikTok, all of that, I think a lot, uh, one trend that I'm seeing is a lot of longer form documentary is, is taking that as archive and contextualizing it to tell a larger story and a more complex story, which is really exciting to me because we're getting different stories and we're getting different storytellers. I love that you brought that up too because I feel like a lot of people poo-poo short form, you know, TikTok and Insta. What's really interesting to me is on TikTok, like there are storytellers, like there are people who are going on and like literally just telling stories and they're so fascinating mm -hmm. to listen to and they're, and it's like just like these seeds of storytelling yeah. that, eventually grow into the bigger stories that we all, you know, are wanting to watch and wanting to tell. Yeah. Before we end, I would love to take some questions from the audience. Oh, she's ready. She was ready. Uh, Eric, right here in the front. Thank you so much. Um, so you mentioned earlier the sort of the multidimensionality of, the, of each of your films and how going into those, you know, it's about, there are several abouts. Um, and when you were still in developing the film, how did you distill down how to talk about your film, knowing that there were so many different abouts? So when you say, somebody asks, what's this about? Well, it's about 72 different things, but like, here's you the mean thread. Like your, your but like, how do you yeah. pitch? Exactly. Well, yes, but, but outside, of the, outside of the formal pitch, outside of the structure of the formal pitch, how did you kind of come up with and decide that this is really what you wanted to say in conversation without being too elaborate? Yeah, I, I think our elevator pitch, uh, evolved with our understanding of where we wanted the film to go. And I think it was a challenge for a while, being like, it's a film about this, it's a film about, you know, 
uh, artificial intelligence, but it's a love story, and then there's like cryogenics, and then you know we <laughs> got to go with the singularity, and then there's like all of this kind of stuff, you know. So, um, um, but then as we really kind of honed in, okay, and focus what our story is, it's like the synopsis just like popped right out. So I think and that, that I think that shows too when you're dealing with complex, multi-layered stories, and it's difficult to know exactly where they are when you kind of have that like this is the definition. You're like, yes, I've got there. Sorry. Oh, um, a couple of years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry. I, uh, this is th this edit particular wasn't a, like a traditional edit in terms of time wise, so it's kind of difficult to to, to to say. But but um, in our uh, um, we had different different iterations of it, and then in the last six months, it's really come into the exact form that we wanted it to be, and then we knew exactly where we were going and what it was about. I mean, I think your, your question's about, you know, it's kind of like there's two ways, right? You're either pitching, you know, I'm like getting on a Zoom with Loren and trying to get Time Studios to help me make my movie, and then I need to have the pitch before I make the movie, right? Or as I'm starting to make the movie. And then there's something like Dig where, you know, I just, we were shooting, my brother and I were just shooting for seven years, cause, and we were paying for it by making music videos and whatever we were doing. And then the pitch happens, when you're pitching it to sell it. And by then you've made the edit and even even then it's hard to sum up a movie like Dig into a sentence, you know? The collision of art and commerce, but it's friendship, it's madness, it's, you know, people say it's the real spinal tap. Sometimes you can use a reference or it's the real Amadeus, you know, and then people go, oh, I know what that is, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's I all also different think all the time. Sometimes saying it out loud is what helps you start being like, nope, that's not right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? You, like, you even if you're sure. saying it to like somebody that you're not actually pitching, like saying right. it out loud, and you're like, well, maybe yeah, I need to that. Definitely pillow talk. Take your partner. <laughs> take all your friends and try it on. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Try it on before the actual pitch. Um, but no, with with Frida, I mean, we were incredibly lucky because, as I said before, it's. It, it was clear from the beginning because of our director, Carla Gutierrez, who is in here somewhere. I see she, she sneaked in here. Yes, Carla. It, it, was, it, was, it was incredibly clear how we would speak about the film. And I think to, to, to Carla's point as well, it, it's because it's in the, the voice of Frida, we wanted to make sure that people understood that there, were, there was contemporary resonance to the things that she, she had gone through, the things that she uh, had written about, and it really emerged from, from Carla. Yeah. Any other questions in the audience? Wow. Oh, one up here. Uh, my question is about Frida. Um, just in general, I feel like Frida has, there's so many narratives out there and they're, it's very commercialized in Mexico, so I was wondering what your responsibility was to bring out the, the truth and your research behind all of that. Yeah, that was, that was at the core of, of everything. I think her story has been told in, in many different ways before, so it was the, the task of, of ensuring that this way not only would be distinct from everything that had come before, but was also as authentic as possible. And so the, the team um, that Carla and Katia assembled of, of archival researchers um, and also the importance of having as many Mexican collaborators as possible from the sound designers to the composers to the animators also lent it, lent it the authenticity that it needed. So I think that's, that was really the, the, the North Star of the, of the film. So as we wrap up here, oh, do you, would we have one? Yeah, yeah, we can take one more. Uh, when when it comes to failure, let's say that you want to film something that has like a limited time to do it, and then you do, couldn't do it the way you wanted, how do you fix that or how do you evolve from that? So you're saying you went into production, you didn't get quite what you wanted, what do you do now? Is everybody still alive? <laughs> Will they still talk to you? But there's there's AI, so that doesn't necessarily matter. <laughs> actually, yeah, right. That is actually really that's true. It's not. Yeah. It's no. scary. Yeah, you shouldn't go and AI their voices. Let's start there because you will lose the trust of your audience there. 
Um, I think you go back. You know, you go back. It's okay. Like, you can go back. I mean, I always, when I schedule a film, I always schedule production and post-production simultaneously, like, in a sort of undulating back and forth so that I can discover what the film needs in the editing room and go back actively without going over budget. So I recommend that, but since maybe that isn't what happened here, you should just figure out a way to get back in there. And the other thing is audio is the most important thing, you know, so you really want to get the voice and then you can figure out a way to visually tell the story. There's a, a line in our um, film from our protagonist, uh, Martin Rothblatt, um, persistence is omnipotence. And um, when you see our film and you see everything that she has accomplished in her life, um, you realize, yeah, you're gonna have doors closed on you. You're gonna like, you're like, oh, the, damn, the, there was no card in the camera or whatever, you know. Uh, I'm an editor. I don't know the reference, but you know. Um, That's a good one. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, just like stay focused, know the end goal, and just keep at it. Yeah, well, so I was going to close with advice, but it sounds like we just had some. I mean, I don't know if, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so much thank for being you, here. Mary. Yeah. And thank, thank you all for joining us. You know, actually, right now we are hosting um, a documentary filmmaker's mixer here in the space. Um, it is a registered event, so if you are not registered already, you can see Nikisha in the pink hat there just uh, because of, <clears throat> Utah liquor laws, we have to make sure that we know everybody that's in the building. So, uh, yeah, if you could just see Nikisha, she can connect you. Thank you for coming. Thank you.